Okay, so today I would like us to go through a particular video that I deem to be a sad story. And it's not a story that you have never heard of. It's nothing new. But this is a pastor who preached the gospel for 19 years. And I would like us to play the video and then um, make certain corrections that he didn't seem to get was a Christian and I would like to drop the years that he served Christ and stuff and make certain assessments so people come to understand what it truly means to be for God because I think most people do not understand what it means to serve God and so when they follow Christ for a while and they seem not to see anything they just back out and they simply not back out but also attack what they used to be before which I personally see to be very demonic and so let's watch i used to believe in god like our very articulate and eloquent speaker before us uh, i used to believe firmly in god i was an ordained minister i preached the gospel for 19 years i felt this presence in my mind as i prayed i got goosebumps as I so daniel Bake made mention of 19. he had served god for 19 years and then after 19, he quit for some reasons after he had come to realize that he was hallucinating or was on something, which I would get to. But this is pretty dangerous because now people watching or people who might have stumbled on his video or something on the internet might conclude if Daniel Baker, as intelligent as he is, a knowledgeable person who had served God for 19 years, is now out of the faith then the reason that might have caused him losing his faith is tangible it's solid and as intelligent as he is most people might follow on the basis that most christians do not really know anything right and i hear most people say that that if you are to dig deeper into the bible you would quit christianity i hear that a lot and so for Daniel Baker to leave the faith, most people who think as such, and even some Christians who also think as such, who do not really have time to study the Bible, might follow suit, and they would leave the faith. And so I'd like us to do a little bit of assessment here, and I think this will help, but we we'll continue. Wait. Daniel Baker was born in June 25th, 1949. Now, I would like us to take his age into consideration, 1949. And he left Christianity in 1984. And so now, let's minus 1949 from 1984. You have 35. And so, according to him, he served for 19 years. And so, he quit Christianity at the age of 30, 35. And so now, let's minus 19 from 35. And so Daniel Barker began preaching the good news at the age of 16. Now, the thing here is, at the age of 16, there are so many things that you might have said or done that your 35-year-old self might disagree with. There are so many things that I think of today of my old self that I disagree with. And I know that when I am 60 years old, there are so many things that I am doing now that I would disagree with because as you grow, you come to realize that most of the decisions you took before weren't so good. But this has to do with God. I took my time to run a couple of checks on him to see who and who were his teacher because those are also very important. If you are to read the Bible all by yourself without a teacher, soon you wouldn't be in the faith soon you wouldn't be in the faith and i always say this jesus christ was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and the devil came testing him in the word and so after you have learned the word of god for a while the, the devil would come and test you and this is where if you do not have any backing as in teachers or shepherds or leaders you could go up to and ask questions soon you would leave because most of the questions that the devil would throw at you you might not um, um, be open to such answers and if you are alone which i think daniel Baker fell victim to he was alone 
doing evangelism and all that all by himself. I doubt the kind of messages he was preaching at that time. You know, let's continue. As I prayed, I got goosebumps as I was in communion with what I thought was the Holy Spirit of God. As I read the Holy Bible and read about the resurrection of Jesus. Um, something quick here. Feeling some kind of heat, you get to hear a lot of Christians say that. And goosebumps all around your body is not a sign the Holy Spirit is, in, is at work or God is at work. Right, don't get it twisted. True Christianity and spirituality has nothing to do with how you feel, but God is always around, and so we do not attribute how we feel or the goosebumps or heat around us to or the kind of coldness that is around to God being around. The devil could also do that, and so let's be um, open to such. I dedicated my life to preaching that gospel that I thought was so real, that gave so much meaning, so much hope, so much beauty to the world. But I've changed my mind. I now know I was deluded. I was having a very real, very powerful, but mental experience that happens in most religions. He realized he was deluded. In other words, he had gone nuts. And so Daniel Barker here is saying 2.8 billion people, well, he referred to religion. And so we have over four to five billion people in this world who are deluded simply because they believe in something right now the thing here is how do you know that you are not now crazy right because you were you were a crazy person who sought after the good and betterment of other people these are some of the things that needs to be studied you used to be good you you claim you did good and you preach the good news. That was the word he used. He preached the good news to the world, which means he sought for the betterment of other people. And that betterment, he found it within the good news. Now that he become an atheist, very narcissistic, self-centered, stingy, um, 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 and all that, he thinks that now this is good where you do not sought for the betterment of people. What better news or what good news to preach to other people than to preach to the poor a message of hope and, and a message with some level of substance that could get people back on their feet doing something for themselves than to say, I used to be crazy and that was what I did. Seeking after the betterment of other people and that was crazy. Now I'm alone thinking of myself, and now I think I'm good. I won't tell you my whole story, uh, but I went through a process of deconversion that took four or five years, starting as a firm believer, evangelical, street preacher. In, in the foreword to my book, Godless, that tells that story, Richard Dawkins writes, Dan Barker was not just a preacher, he's the kind of preacher you would not want to sit next to on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> that was me, I was so convinced, I was so in love with Jesus, my Savior and my Lord, but I went through a process, evangelical, fundamentalist, where I migrated into more of a moderate, where I preached less hell and more love, into more of a more liberal stage in my life, until eventually I dumped out all the bathwater and I found out there's no baby there. And so the kind of messages that he preached, he made mention of. He preached judgmental messages, hell came into liberalism. Now, I think that is where the problem occurred, liberalism, right? I wouldn't get into that. But. It's just words. It's just arguments. But from the very articulate words we heard tonight, we didn't see any dots connected. We heard a lot of argument, but when it comes to evidence, only two pieces were offered, which we will probably get to, personal experience and the resurrection of Jesus. If nothing comes from nothing, then God cannot exist because God is not nothing. If that premise is true, that nothing comes from nothing, and if God is something, then you've just shot yourself in the foot. Today is Thursday. What does that mean? The evolutionary theory claims that everything came out of nothing. Now, the nothing comes out of nothing, he's claiming here, as is with regards to the existence of God. Who created God? 
right? God himself is a self-existing being who existed before existence. We might not have the right words to explain or define what was before was, but that is God. If you've watched this video up to this point, kindly don't forget to subscribe, like, share. Now, the term God is given to an ultimate supreme being who is spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. Now, the issue here is we, the human race, happen to be living in time. And so what goes on outside of time might be a bit dicey for our minds to comprehend. God isn't nothing. Like he said, God isn't nothing. And he had no beginning. He began the beginning. He existed before the beginning, and so he had no beginning. That is what the Bible teaches us. And we would find that in John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. That word beginning over there in Greek is a key, which speaks concerning the extreme origin of a thing the extremeness to what something originated. And so in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Was with God signifies God existed with his word. They were one. And so in the beginning where our minds begin to think or process, the word already existed. And that is actually a verse that tackles the deity of Jesus Christ, and so we wouldn't get into what that. What does that mean, Mr. President? <laughs> Thursday. What does it mean? It's the, it's the day that millions of people believed in the god Thor. There was a gap in understanding. There was a mystery. What is that noise in the sky? What are those lights? What is all this? What is that? It must be an agency. It must, be some de it must be some being or something, and they named it Thor. And today we have a day of the week. We don't have a Jesus day, but we do have a Thor day that, we're, that millions of people believe in, and maybe some still do. But that deity has found itself on the scrap heap of history, just like when I looked at the deity I used to believe in, the God of the Bible. It started for me with the simple idea that Jesus told a parable about the prodigal son. A parable is what? It's a fiction. It doesn't matter if the prodigal son actually existed in history. It was the moral tale that mattered. The ancient Israelites made up a parable or a metaphor about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and a talking snake. Look up in the dictionary the word fable. You will find it as a moral tale involving talking animals. We know that Adam and Eve could not have existed because of evolution. I, I assume everyone in this room accepts the solid fact of the evolution of the human species. So Adam and Eve could not have been real people. It was a metaphor, and many Christians accept that fact. They know there's metaphor, figures of speech in the Bible. But in my process, if the prodigal son is a fabrication, if Adam and Eve are a metaphor, then what about this other character, this Yahweh, this Jehovah, this Elohim character? Where do you draw the line? When we know that humans are very good at inventing myths, like the turtle in my Native American ancestry, the turtle that swam across the waters, brought up the mud from the bottom, created the continents. A beautiful story, a wonderful metaphor, but that didn't really happen. The God character himself is also one of those fictions. Like Adam and Eve and the concept of God are not metaphors. Let me give you a couple of metaphors. A couple of metaphors. One would be Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the bread of life. There are certain parables in the Bible that also could be taken as metaphors. But then aside metaphors, we have certain symbolisms and similes. And so much different kinds of speeches used in reference to something in the Bible. But to say the entire story of Adam and Eve and the concept of Yahweh, is a metaphor thus debunking the authenticity or what the story communicates it's pretty funny then nothing in this world is true if that is it then nothing in this world is. if we can't take a simple story in the bible to be true then we we are lost of history we can't we can't really 
say we have history because the bible aside history aside poetry prophecies contains history and so if we are to take everything in the bible as a as a metaphor a fi- a fable and what then we are left with nothing and this is the same book this is the same book most archaeologists use in digging up their information let's not forget that I came to realize Maybe a useful fiction, maybe it gave meaning, maybe it gave hope, maybe it gave purpose. None the, a fiction, nonetheless. The reason I am a non-believer today is because of the lack of evidence and argument for a deity. If there were any real evidence... There are so many evidence out there that people simply wouldn't want to agree and personally those disagreements mostly are emotional right they do not want it to be true most atheists atheism is simply a person who doesn't want god to be true these are people who simply want to play god and so the idea of a god somewhere instructing them as to what and what not to do is something that they do not agree to and that is atheism in short if there were any real evidence for a god then by now someone should have won the nobel prize for pointing that out any scientist in the world would jump at the chance to say here we go i mean if there is a hitherto unknown force of the cosmos that we haven't yet been able to d- determine what scientist in the world would not love to make that point that hasn't been done yet all we have are what we would call, and I think many believers call, God of the gap. The thunder and lightning was a gap that is now closed. The perhaps fine-tuning of the initial constants, perhaps the origin of the Big Bang. We do have some gaps in science. In fact, it is those gaps that drive science. Without those gaps, we wouldn't have scientific inquiry. What we are offered with is faith and belief. And I think that most people trying to debunk Christianity tend to misprioritize the Bible and science. Science actually has nothing against the Bible. So as the Bible also has nothing against science. Now, this is what Galileo said. Galileo, in one of his writs, stated that science is the study of the works of God. Whereas the Bible also teaches us the words of God. And so you have God's word, which is the Bible, and then God's work. What science does is to figure out or try its best coming out with the process. It doesn't teach us who God is. And most of the things that we do in our life aren't scientific. Right? But... It's so unfortunate we tend to attribute everything to science. Meanwhile, nothing we do is scientific. To bring God or to prove God through science is impossible. You cannot prove God through science. We rather test God. And that kind of test isn't the kind of test you run through a test tube or a hypothesis. But when people tend to hate on God, they try to cover that kind of system with science. And it doesn't work like that. And you come to realize that they will talk concerning faith. And I, he made mention of faith. So let's continue. So You were very see. eloquent in saying that you have a belief in a God, that what you believe is God. But belief is not knowledge. Belief is simply an assertion. According to the Bible that you believers believe, belief is the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. Belief is not evidence. Anytime you have to accept an assertion by faith, you're admitting that that assertion cannot be accepted on its own merits. It doesn't have the strength to be accepted as any other perhaps scientific hypothesis would be taken. Do scientists gather together every Sunday morning in their... Most people tend to get faith, believe, wrong, 
and do their best to place it side by side with proof. Now, the problem here is what he quoted, Hebrews 11. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Most people tend to, most unbelievers tend to underline not seen and say faith is blind believing because the Bible says you do not need to see, you simply have to believe blindly, which is false. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The substance over there is what we call sorting after God through evidence, hypostasis, that is the Greek word, which means foundation. And so there has to be something solid that your faith is based upon. And so faith is not blind. Faith demands evidence. Check through the entire Bible. You come to realize that most people came to Jesus for for healing simply because they had seen other people being healed. Other than that, they wouldn't have followed Jesus. And so the evidence to Jesus' authenticity was that other people saw him and they walked. Now, the not seen can be tackled from various perspectives. Not seen. I have not seen God, right? But the substance, the hypostasis that I could build my faith upon is that I have read and heard. Probably some people are even lucky to have experienced. You go into most Muslim communities today and you come to realize most of them have experienced God. They've, they've had encounter with the supernatural. And so believing in God comes natural. It is very, very easy for them to believe. I have faith in God based off what I have read, right? The Bible, the Gospels that we read in the Bible, the New Testament is complete history. We do not run history through a science lab for proof. Other than that, Abraham Lincoln wouldn't be true. Darwin, the father of atheism, wouldn't be true because now we would have to go bring them all back and run them through a scientific method or some kind of hypothesis for it for them to be concluded as true science is simply based on fact the repetitiveness of a theory and so if that thing could be repeated and found constant then it means it is science history is not like that history happens once you cannot run a historical figure through a repetitive theory to conclude Truly, he existed. It happens once and that is it. And that is what we read in the Bible. Like I said before, the Bible contains so many things, including history. And so if we cannot accept the historical narratives that we read from in the Bible, then our hearts and minds are going to be troubled because it's like we are ready to accept all manner of history except the one in the Bible. And it's very sad. Sunday morning in their scientific sanctuaries and bow their heads and sing, Yes, the Higgs boson is real. <laughs> I know in my heart the Higgs boson is real. I will have faith. I will be strong to this secular world who challenges my belief that the God particle is real. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> if, if they did such a thing, you would think they were pretty insecure on the concept, wouldn't you? you know, that's what we find with faith, a constant puffing yourself up, be strong, resist the world, believe in these absurdities in spite of the doubts. Not true. Look for the evidence. The evidence would substantiate your faith in Christ, right? Don't simply blindly believe because somebody taught you to believe. If somebody taught you to believe, that is the same way you would leave. Somebody will teach you to leave and you would leave. Seek for the evidence yourself. Test me. Test the Lord and see if he is not good. If he will not show himself unto you and bring unto you the abundance of rain from the dews of heaven. Right. God wants you to test him. God doesn't want you to believe in him based off the words of someone. Because that person might lose his faith like Daniel Baca. Imagine all the people but Daniel taught. Now that he's left. Most of the people will live along with him because he didn't teach them to follow God. Paul says that mentor or model after me 
because I point you to God or Jesus. The day I fail to point to Jesus, forget about me and continue following Jesus because man is man. You can't trust man, right? The uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ, the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the absolute worst example anyone could possibly give for the reliability of the Bible. And I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> Let me tell you why I'm not exaggerating. Many stories in the Bible are given once or twice. The resurrection story is given five times. You can compare them. Scholars have never been able to reconcile those contradictory accounts of the resurrection of Jesus. And besides that, and th there are many of them, was the tomb open or closed when the women arrived? What message did the angels give? How many angels were at the tomb? And so on. Uh, besides that, we see through the development in the first century of the Christian myth that the earliest stories were simple. There were no angels. There were, there were very few remarkable events. But as you go 10, 20, 30 years later, you find more and more until you get to the book of John where you find these outlandish stories what you see in the development of the resurrection story in the New Testament is the development of a legend. Starting simple, growing over time, getting more and more fantastic. It's a mistake to treat those accounts as if they were flat, as if they all happened at one time. We can see before our eyes the development from a simple, unvarnished, perhaps some element of truth in some story about someone who may have spiritually ascended, like we say grandma died and went to heaven. Maybe the early apostles said Jesus died and went to heaven, but that exaggerated. That is not true. You, you, aside the Bible, which most people don't want to pick truth from, you could read the historical narratives of Suetonius, Tacitus, Gaius Pliny the Younger. Now, these are Roman writers, right? And they all wrote concerning the lives of Christians in both the first and second century. He made mention of the four Gospels not agreeing to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for that reason, the resurrection shouldn't be the basis as to why the Bible is true. Now, if you study the four Gospels, what you come to realize is perspectives. People are writing from various perspectives to a certain kind of audience. Not the same audience, a certain type of audience. Luke is writing to the Grecians. Mark is writing to the Romans. Matthew is writing to both. Matthew is writing to the Jews. And then we have John, who is writing to both Jews and Gentiles. Now, these people didn't sit to copy each other, if that is what he wanted. Because if they had sat down to copy each other, then the question would have also been, Oh, they wrote the same thing, which means they copied. And so the Bible can't be authentic. But this is the case where people are writing from various perspectives or agreeing to an infant testimony that Jesus died. No, let's begin. That there was a man by name Jesus who came from Nazareth, who lived, taught, died, resurrected, ascended and was witnessed by over 500 people during his ascension. Now, you read Matthew chapter 27, verse 17, if I'm not wrong, and you come to realize that even as Jesus showed up before his ascension, or one of those, not all the people believed. They saw him there, they saw the man, and didn't believe that was the man. Right, and that was in, in the 19th, 17th, 18th, 19th century. You find a couple of people, not not necessarily a couple, a lot of people who show up during those times, trying to write theories to debunk the existence of Jesus, which all have fallen flat along the way, because people rose. Most apologists rose during those times to debunk all that, and. One that sounded so funny to me was the Swoon's theory, where it states all the people there at that time hallucinated at the same time. It sounds very foolish to me, right? And that is the that is the point. That is the angle he is coming from, and the kind of 
perception he's trying to create for people, but this needs time. This needs time. When people think that Christians are unknowledgeable people, I tend not to understand how they understand. They think they think Christians are unknowledgeable people. Christians are dumb. And so when even Christians become unbelievers, they think they have gained knowledge. And for that reason, their colleague Christians are dumb, which is very, very heaven. But that exaggerated. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not evidence for a God. And even then, it would just be evidence that a man rose from the dead. How do you connect the dots? It's not evidence. We suffer also from a we coherent agree. definition of a God. We have a proposition. This house believes in God. What is that word? What does that word God mean? There are many, and I don't have time to go into much detail, but there are many incompatible properties that many theists assign to this deity, much like saying uh, this deity is a married bachelor. Can a married bachelor exist? God is simply a title given to an ultimate supreme being. That is why it makes so much sense when God shows up to a group of people and based on what they need to accomplish, he gives them a name that they should call him. And then through that, he helps them accomplish that. And so God throughout the entire New Old Testament, we've seen um, as in God, as in G-O-D, but provides names for people. You have um, um, El Shaddai, you have Adonai, and then he showed up in flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. And so God has always had a name, right? It's not just this God, but it's the term God is simply a title that we give to an ultimate supreme being simply because we do not know him. But as you come to know him, now you get to know his name. Okay. And also he made mention of the resurrection not being a reason for which I spoke about, but there is one thing that you could also look into, which is the apostles having to declare Christ as God and being killed for it. And so the apostles has to, had to declare that Jesus is God. Continually, they were summoned most of the time, but most often than not, they were captured, tortured, and brought before higher authorities to denounce God, which they didn't. If what they believed in was a made-up story, don't you think they could have easily denied Jesus so they could live right? If I am to make up something concerning somebody and I am being arrested and asked, deny that thing you are making up and we will make you leave. Continue to say that is true and we will kill you. It would be very easier for me to say, oh, I was just playing around. No, it's not true. But that is not the case for the apostles and most of the believers that grew up from the first to the sixth century and even today where people hold on high to the name Jesus until they are killed, for the apostles to die for what they believed in is evidence. And that is who I have become today. After studying the Gospels, I will die for the Gospel too. Not by a sword or taking a sword up to someone, but if a sword is being pulled up to me and say, with the instruction, deny what you believe in and live. I won't. Because we have gotten to a point where we have seen God. That is why Daniel Baker here needs prayers. I'm not sure if he's still alive or dead, but if he's alive, he needs prayers. If he's dead, well, the devil has got him. So, Can a married bachelor exist? Logically, it cannot, and there are mutually incompatible prop, uh, characteristics of this deity that many theists have put forward that make it a married bachelor. For example, God is supposedly an omniscient being who has free will. But if you know the future, you can't have free will. I'm not talking about human free will, and that's a big debate whether we have it or not. 
Even atheists agree among them, disagree among themselves. But God, presumably, this being is a personal being with free will who knows his own future decisions. In order to have free will, whatever that means, there has to be a period of indeterminacy during which you truly do have options. I could choose coffee or tea. I could choose this or that. But if you know your future options, you have no choice. You have no freedom. You are not a free uh, personal agency. So if your definition of God is that God is omniscient and free, he cannot exist. He's a married bachelor. I know theologians try to tinker with definitions. Uh, by the way, if God cannot change what he knows he's going to do tomorrow at 12 noon, that also puts some limits on his omnipotence, doesn't it? God cannot change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. One thing we seem to forget concerning free will. Man has free will. We exercise free will. God doesn't change because he doesn't live in time. Right? Beings subjected to time have the ability to change. But God doesn't dwell within time. And so he has no reason to change because there is no time. And so he is as he is. There is no need to change. The problem here is that men are born with a will and the opportunity to choose. Now, the interesting underlining factor to this is that God knows the end result of every choice that you take. You know, in the book of Jeremiah, God said, I knew you before you were born. Right. I knew you. I knew you before you were born. Now, this is my will for you. And so man has the ability to exercise his free will on choosing God's will or the devil's will. It is not as if man was born or destined to a particular ending where your ending is hell. No, you are born with the ability to choose. And in those choices that you make lies good and evil. And so now you can either choose God or choose the devil. Now, God, the ultimate supreme being who resides outside of time, because he's omniscient in his character, knows what your end result will be when you choose his will and what your end result will be if you choose your will, which is the way of the dead. Evil. Now, what Dan Baker here stated made it seem as if one of God's attributes is that he also changes, and so he's not reliable. If God changes, then it means God is limited to time. God is not limited to time, and so he can't change. His word stays forever. We read certain passages in the Bible where God changed his word, or God, it is not true. It is just for the reader to understand how God relates with man. If you check the Greek and Hebrew words used in those places, you would understand God more. And so God never changes. Man has the will. The will angels even do not have. And so it is up unto us to choose God. And God doesn't impose his will on us as to what to eat in the morning, to drink coffee, or to do this. God doesn't do that. He leaves us to take free will decisions. And that is what a loving God does to a loving being. He doesn't torture us or bully us into some level of subjection where we do not seem to have a choice. We've had choices right from the beginning. Dan Baker here was a Christian. He switched and became an atheist. He has a choice. And in choosing or taking all those parts, God didn't force him, right? There was no time where God tortured him to continually stay a Christian.
he chose freely and he lived freely and up till now god has not tortured him and so let's not make it seem as if we were born with we were born and destined to walk on one path and that path leads to death and so for that reason we can't do anything about it you have something to, you there is so, there you can do something about it you can change your path if you want to right just as a criminal today could say i am no more a criminal because i do not want to die by a gun an aimless death and so he changes that is how god is calling everybody to him the good news has been made available to everyone and because god is a loving god who doesn't impose his will on us he leaves us to to freely choose him and that is what a loving being will do as you watch me for instance if you are married or let's say there is this lady that you like there is no way you can say i love you so much i would force you to love me no that wouldn't be love and that is what god does for us also put some limits on his omnipotence doesn't it a lot of these arguments from uh, design and teleology for example suffer from begging the question it's rather like the man who is amazed Look at how all these rivers were made to flow right along the state boundaries. <laughs> how do you explain that? Nice. It must have been a massive feat of engineering, a huge economic development. How did they get those rivers to do that? Isn't that incredible? And yet that's how a lot of this teleological thinking is among how did the human eye evolve? How, did the, how do you explain that? There must have been design behind it. It does look like design, doesn't it? Those rivers look like they were designed to flow right along those boundaries. It's an upside down kind of thinking and in, in a sense begs the question. The, the whole idea that uh, in some of these teleological arguments that complexity requires a designer and uh, Richard somewhere here pointed out in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, anything that is complex enough to design functional complexity, any, any deity who could, could design has to have a mind that is at least as functionally complex as the thing that it designed, right? If your premise is that functional complexity requires a designer, if that's your premise, then the mind of that deity also must, by that premise, require a designer. And you get into this infinite regress of, well, then God needed a bigger God and a bigger God. I think most scientists prefer to just stop with what we do know rather than speculate endlessly about a, a mountain of turtles. <laughs> Another Another lack that uh, takes against the evidence for existence of a God is the lack of agreement among believers. If there is a deity that you love and care about, why do no two believers agree on any social or moral issue? You name it. Gay marriage, uh, doctor-assisted suicide, stem cell research, uh, death, uh, the war, you name these social issues we're struggling with. You find devout, praying, Bible-believing Christians on both sides of those issues. Paul wrote in the Bible, God is not the author of confusion. But can you think of a single book that's caused more confusion than that Bible? They don't agree. Why, why not? Why shouldn't it be clear? Why shouldn't this all-loving, all-caring deity make it clear to us? It is not. They have fought, idea over each, fought with each other over these issues. The Thirty Years' War, which was based to some degree on the confessional differences over infant baptism and transubstantiation, people were killed. John Calvin had his friend Servetus killed over a simple misplacement of a preposition. The lack of agreement among believers is a serious problem towards the existence of an all-loving, all-caring God. Well, that's a point. That's a good point that Christians do not agree on so many things. But that isn't or shouldn't be a negative factor that should contribute to disbelief. If Christians do not agree on the same thing, it actually leads people to learn more. It is okay to disagree. It is very normal to disagree on so many issues. But what the text has said is what we must go by. If the Bible says Jesus is God in so many ways, right? 
and certain denominations do not agree that Jesus is God, but then he is the brother of Lucifer, then you know that we are not on the same side. You might have been reading a different Bible, which is always truly so, right? And so it is not bad to disagree. I wouldn't lose my faith simply because a bunch of Christians are disagreeing on it on a subject. It's normal to disagree. In fact, the more you disagree, the more it pushes you to learn more. And so I don't think that is anything bad. Okay, and so this is where we draw the curtains that was done back here. The Christian turned atheist. You know, and he'd been going hard on this route for over 40 years now. Let's not condemn people who do not believe in what we believe in. You know, Christ came not to condemn the world, but to bring all men unto him. And that is what we ought to do today. Preaching the gospel with love, you know, in truth and faithfulness. Praying that we would win men unto Christ. As the Great Commission instructs us.